For those joining us, hello, hello, hello. Please like, press subscribe. I am very, very honoured to have me one of the big political sensations of the moment. It's true. <laughs> That's just a fact. <laughs> Philip Proudfoot from Northern Independence Party, which has become a real force in British politics. You thought 2020 and 2019 and all the other years were, were wacky and surprising. Well... Still some surprises in store. <laughs> but the Northern New Brunswick, but just, I'm going to talk about it with you, Philip. I mean, you know, this is a party, obviously, which it advocates independence for the North. It blends that with an unashamed support for, for socialism uh, and for progressive politics. I suppose my first question to you is, is this a joke that just like, span out of control? No. So I think it's important to look at the, how we've begun. We've begun as a Twitter account that responded to that moment when Andy Burnham was informed that he was that Manchester was going to get substantially less funding than the rest of the UK. And that bred an initial like outpouring of anger. So we were at the right place at the right time. And we just made a Twitter account that was the Northern Independence Party. And then I put up a Google sign up form and then loads of people joined that. And then we started a WhatsApp group and then that WhatsApp group turned into other different online organizing spaces and it like slowly developed into uh, the beginnings of a political party. And I mean, of course, we do specifically use elements of humor to promote the party because there's nothing wrong with laughing. Like humor is fine and it, it, parts of it are a joke. And it's also it's, it's a much more sophisticated joke than people seem to think. So. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the Labour Party's like insane overreaction to us uh, this week where they started like saying that we're forwarding silly stereotypes and we're making a joke out of the North. We're actually laughing at them and the way in which the current leadership of the Labour Party views the North in this kind of patronising way. So we put a whippet on our logo to make fun of them. And also there's nothing wrong with whippets, let's be clear. But yeah, no, it is a joke, but we are serious. It's a joke, but we're serious. I mean, our manifesto was leaked to HuffPost, right? That's a serious political party. We're getting our manifesto leaked now, and that manifesto contains serious policies um, like, you know, decriminalisation of cannabis, a uh, referendum on the monarchy and a future independent north, and also a very important policy on worrying sheep. Um, oh, which really? That is a very, it's a big thing <laughs> in the doorstep of the north. People don't realise this. Yeah, sheep yeah. Worrying. Cheap worrying. It costs farmers a lot of money and it might seem jokey, but we have a lot of uh, farmers in NIP, you know. Oi, we... Leave those sheep alone. <laughs> all in all, we're just a cheap warrior who, I can't think of some more lyrics for that, but maybe that's an anthem the Northern Independence Party could maybe adapt, work on. It's just an idea. You don't have to take it. No pressure. <laughs> But while we're here, just think about it. So, I mean, look, I'm a plastic northerner. I've sold out my northern roots. I was born in Sheffield at the age of four, lived in Falkirk in Scotland for a couple of years. But then I grew up in Stockport in Greater Manchester. So part of me, you know, obviously anything, I have lived down south for 15 years, but I hear about the north. I miss, you know, Manchester. Whenever I go back, I'm home. I hear about this and I'm intrigued, of course. You know, that, that northern pride never goes away. Yeah. What I suppose I'm interested in is, I mean, firstly, let's talk about how it became a phenomenon, certainly watching it grow online, in that, uh, because now you're standing Thelma Walker, who's a former Labour MP, to be the candidate in, in the Hartlepool by-election. Yeah. What do you think, because there's no shortage, there's always been lots of left of Labour parties that have been set up, which to be brutally frank, there's a whole graveyard of them over the last yeah. century where yeah. you can look around and look at their skeletal remains. They haven't lifted off any of them. Yeah. What, what is it about the Northern Independence Party, do you think, at the moment, has caught so much attention in imagination? Because whenever I log on to, certainly Twitter at the moment, I, I keep seeing supporters of yours who are <laughs> yeah. very enthusiastic. Yeah. What's going on? What's it, what mood is it catching? Yeah, so I would like want to, want to start by asking you about about why it is you feel a plastic, like a plastic northerner and why you felt it's, you know, just a natural state of affairs that we all move to the south because you know that I've also lived in London for a long time as well and over time I've began to th begun to think about why 
Why is that the case? Why do we just accept this? Why do we think that it's just normal to have all opportunities concentrate in the South, that if my parents fall ill, I have to get on a train and to spend hours and hours and hours getting back, whereas people who were born in the Southeast and live in the Southeast and families in the Southeast can get to their parents in a small matter of time. Why is it we have members who live just outside of uh, Manchester, the big metropole in the North, and even they're being told now, you need to move to the South, you need to move to London to chase opportunities. And it's important to just be clear that, you know, we're not in a normal country in terms of centralization. We're 300% more centralized than the com a comparable developed nation. So this is not actually normal. Um, so this is why it's capturing a mood is people have begun to realize that. And the reason they're realizing it is because COVID-19 is, you know, as, uh, uh, as um, the, the director general of the UN said, a great X-ray that reveals the fractures in society and the fracture that exists in this country is the North-South divide and no party is taking it seriously. Of course, the Tories have put it on the agenda with levelling up, but all major serious think tanks looking at this subject like IPPR North uh, will point out that the levelling up agenda is, is a fraud, basically, you know, 750 jobs to Darlington is not a new policy. Offloading parts of the civil service to the North has been carried out under new labour. It, it is a standard approach. It's not the kind of joined up thinking that's needed to rebalance the economy. And that's why I think we're capturing a mood, basically, as well as the fact that we are, you know, unashamedly democratic socialists who have been chased out of the Labour Party. The Labour Party has chased out its activists. We've welcomed them in. So part of the answering the question is, why are we getting so much traction? Well, we have wonderful, talented, young people who are engaged in the, um, in the Labour Party and now actively taking part in our movement and that's why um, you know and we're answering that question that Labour refuses to answer is why was the 2017 manifesto so popular in the north why you can't just get rid of those policies and replace it with flags and racism um, brutal but difficult to have a comeback to that with I mean in terms of the the arguments you're making about regional inequality are just self-evidently factually true I mean just yeah. Britain is one of the most region has some of the most acute regional inequalities of a comparable Western nation, yeah, and is also a very centralised nation. Um, you know, if you look at other countries like Germany, there are young people can move around the country and settle down in in, in different parts and, exactly. and and manage to get a fulfilling life, existence, settle down, have families, and be relatively comfortable compared to to here. And here it's interesting actually looking at the electoral map of Britain because some of the so-called red wall seats, of course, in the north, also the Midlands, um, what the evidence shows is the percentage, the proportion of younger people has, has collapsed Correct. Um, yeah. over the last uh, decade. So whilst the number of people over the age of 65 has increased, now we know there's a massive age gap in politics. That's actually new. That's not mm -hmm. in 1983. That's your mm -hmm. These yeah. days, young people have overwhelmingly supported the Labour Party. But you, so the points you make about regional inequality, about not being able to get, uh, you know, the lack of opportunities to ser to secure jobs, housing, all of that is true. I suppose my question would be, you know, I, I, I suppose class solidarity. You know, mm -hmm. the argument always put, for example, when it comes to Scottish independence against the argument, a leftist argument mm -hmm. against independence would be that a... A uh, supermarket worker in Glasgow has more in common with a supermarket worker in Manchester, mm -hmm. Cardiff and Penzance and London mm -hmm. than they do with their own bosses. Mm -hmm. So if we look, I live in Islington, so that's how much yeah. actually made ex-Northern I am. I'm, always yeah. a I'm, not, I'm not an ex-Northern. Now, Islington is a byword for kind of champagne socialism. It's, you know, seen as a, re you know, pl mm -hmm. professional middle class readout. 40% of children grow up in poverty in Islington. Mm -hmm. And some of the worst child poverty in the country is actually in London. Full mm -hmm. stop, it has a massive, particularly acute housing crisis, above average low wages, a lot of the, a lot of the last few years above average unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, it is one of the hardest places in Britain to be a low-paid worker. So I suppose mm -hmm. isn't the danger with the argument advanced by the Northern Independence Party that rather than say, well, actually, across the north and south of England, plus Wales and Scotland, working people should unite on the basis of their common economic interest against a common enemy which doesn't respect borders rather than further dividing up 
Well, there's lots of ways to respond to that question. Um, in, ter in terms of um, regionalised experiences of class, we believe in regionalised experiences of class. So, uh, of course, people in London suffer from incredibly high rents. That's a particular form of like London, London level exploitation on that basis. But we are not um, a kind of like um, exclusionary movement or anything like that. You know, we want to build a country in the north of, of this island where if people want to escape from exploitation in London, they could move to the north instead of having it the other way around, which is what we just talked about, which it has been for generations upon generations. If you could escape your hyper exploitative landlord and move to a country that has, you know, widespread provision of uh, decent housing run by the state, you'd probably do that um, or you'd have that option. Uh, we're not breaking down solidarity because there is an emerging uh, London independence movement. I mean, there are several, whichever one um, moves up through the pack, we'll support. It's also like, you know, when I'm talking on the left to people about this, it's kind of like they need to understand it's a strategic proposition. It's a where do we go from now proposition, which is that one of the biggest problems is we need to break up the traditional Westminster system. And how are we ever going to achieve that? How is London going to benefit from Scotland potentially likely on the way out gaining independence, Welsh independence gaining traction? And then what happens then? You know, we will be stuck in forever Tory England. The North has 70% of the time never been represented by the government it votes for. It, it has the same sort of relationship with Westminster um, as does Scotland and Wales. I believe that, you know, we should not be stuck in forever Tory England. And if there are movements that grow in the South for independence, we'll support them. We'll also welcome anyone from the South who wants to move to an independent North and help build this basically normal social democratic, uh, democratic socialist country in the North, you know, like, you know, think Sweden, you know, we're just going to make a, a lovely country where we can reverse that flaw and people can come and have enjoy basic rights and dignity in work. That's the proposition. And it's a strategic proposition because I don't know where we go from here because there is no major political party advocating for these, um, advocating for democratic socialism other than us. You know, maybe in the future what we're going to see and what some people within NIP advocate for is an emerging coalition of parties where, for instance, we will stand in all of the seats in the north and other parties will stand in seats in the south. But breaking down regional inequality is no bad thing. And breaking down the Westminster system is no bad thing. It's a strategic proposition. And we can exercise solidarity from an independent North, potentially in a stronger position than we could within the Labour Party right now. And I think you'd agree that's hard to argue against. We'll definitely talk about Labour, I promise. In terms <laughs> of, I mean, another, you know, another alternative would be to argue, agitate for a federal Britain so yeah. that you have meaningful devolution and not the kind of devolution George Osborne pushed, which was to devolve cuts. Basically, it was a means of protecting the central government from being blamed for cuts. You basically give devolve those powers to local authorities, and then they and they take the blame. Genuine a a, a federal Britain, which is based on a redistribution of wealth and power, um, where you do redistribute wealth and resources throughout the country. Yeah, which you can do within a federal setup whilst giving meaningful power to local government. So the likes of Andy Burnham would have a massively beefed up uh, administration in terms of powers. Wouldn't that be a more a, a more feasible proposal that more people in the north would feel sympathetic for a northern regional party which advocates for autonomy for the north rather than full blown independence? No, that would not be more feasible because that was advocated in 2004 and the North rejected it. The reason it was rejected is because we're not interested in having more politicians separating us from power. What we're interested in is power. So it would fail. I don't believe for a second that anyone in the North would vote for further devolution, more expensive talking shops, more chains of command before you finally reach whoever has the hands on the purse strings. No, we want power, power in our communities. And we do actually support federalism, but federalism within an independent North. I should say at least that debate is ongoing around the political system. But personally, I support a sort of federalised system across the North because the key thing is we need to stop our cities and regions competing with each other over funding. We have to have a system that allows um, for sort of a mutual community type sort of growth approach where everyone grows at the same time rather than having competition. 
So yeah, I mean, I welcome people who want to talk about federalization, but that's not what our party advocates. Our party advocates for independence because we think people want power, not politics. In terms of nationhood, I mean, you obviously talk about Scotland, Wales. Uh, I have my own Welsh heritage, hence my name. Yeah. My, uh, my dad's family are from North Wales. I have Plaid Cymru councillors on that side of the family. Um, you know, my, my dad's from Welsh speaking, the Glyn the Peninsula, <laughs> Welshist Wales. Um, but isn't the point that, you know, they are clearly nations. Scotland and Wales are clearly coherent nations. They have a clear national cohesive identity. I mean, every national, you know, within a national identity, there, there are lots of contradictions, not least based on class, uh, as I discussed, and just because you have a common national identity and culture doesn't doesn't mean you ha don't have acute differences as well. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what's different about the North? The North isn't. I mean, I know we talk about Northumbria, historic Northumbria, you should talk about that. But <laughs> Northern England isn't a nation. Like, it isn't a coherent nation. Are you telling me a... you've never felt that you're from a different place than the rest of the UK when you've gone to London and you've talked to people? You've never felt that, that the North feels like a different mindset, a different space, a different way of thinking. You've never felt that, honestly. Of course, of course, of course, of course <laughs> that's definitely true. Yeah. However, I think of London as a different country yeah. from the rest of England. I mean, where I grew up in Stockport, so I grew up near the yeah. centre of Stockport, and London has more in common with New York and Paris than it does with Stockport. Stockport is just, it's just, where I grew up is so different. I can't even, you know, look yeah. the food. But equally, Manchester, and look, I got seven miles away from the centre of Manchester, but Stockport and Manchester were very, very different places as well. Yeah. I mean, man, but, you know, major cities are different from small towns. Small yeah. towns are different from rural areas. You're from the northeast. I'm from yeah. the northwest. They are different. They're very different. I mean, what do you think about that? And do you really think, do you really think that Liverpool is that different to uh, Newcastle? Really? Like in turn, oh, Liverpool's got. I mean, you know, they. But a lot of people live will say they're scouts, not English. I mean, yeah, I know, but, but a, they've got. A, they've always got a national identity. Yeah, scouts. but that's but that's also specifically why we support like this kind of um, uh, sort of civic federalist. Well, uh, why people within the party support that is that one of the great things about the North is that we do have those like really strong civic identities and you don't want a political system that takes that away from people. So obviously, you know, the Scouse element within NIP are, you know, you have those who really want it to be an independent city state within, <laughs> within an independent North. And we're not opposed to having that because it's all about the politics of the possible, like imagining what it could look like. But I would say if you look at the basic sort of um, structural and economic relationship between um, Liverpool and Westminster, Newcastle and Westminster, you're going to see relatively similar things. So if you look at Hartlepool, for instance, and Preston, so some of the conversations ongoing right now are what are the kind of things we're going to be proposing for Hartlepool when we win that election. And the main thing is going to be, um, uh, it's going to be going to have the Hartlepool model, which is the Preston model just taken to Hartlepool. And we've got now quite a lot of members in Hartlepool. And every time we talk about the Preston model, they're incredibly excited about that. So that shows actually that the kind of solutions that address different parts of the North uh, would work in, in different areas. So Hartlepool, the Preston model, the big problem with Hartlepool is the same as you find in all Northern towns. You probably, arguably, I know, found this, find this in Southern towns as well. But if you start insourcing all that supply, et cetera, et cetera, we'd actually be able to regenerate these towns because you know what the policy is at the moment, it's managed decline, right? And managed decline is injustice. You made a point earlier to all of us, to our towns losing all of our young people. That's a specific policy decision that's been taken by Westminster to allow these towns to fail, potentially become commuter belts to larger cities in the north, or maybe just people all move to the south, you know. That's that's a common experience, and that binds the north together. That antagonism is what binds us, is that we are being left to rot as a policy decision, and that's injustice, and we're going to fight against that. So that's where our common cause comes from that unites us. And I tell you, the internet is amazing for this. Like... Having people from the Northwest, Northeast, Cumbria, Yorkshire, all together in our big mass meetings and, and hearing from people, just listening to their grievances, they're the same. You know what alarmed me the other day is that I spoke to someone and she was um, telling me, she's an older member, and she was telling me her kids have started sending money back to her, to, to, to her in the North. And I, I work in development and that's a remittance structure. We've got a remittance structure going on now in this country built through policy decisions. 
I, I find it hypocritical. I spend my day job studying these kinds of things in the global south. And now they're happening right here in England through policy decision, not even through war, nothing. Through policy decision, we now have a remittance structure. And that's where the identity comes from. It's grievance and a common relationship to Westminster, as well as our humour, pies, gravy. But we only do that to poke foot at, at the bloody blue labour tendency. That's why we do that. I mean, I have to say, chips and gravy is definitely something I do associate with growing up. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's pat it's just true. I mean, yeah, we go around. You know, the only pat the only patronising thing is thinking that the way you appeal to us is not through policy, but through like for patriotism while not giving nurses a pay rise. That's patriot. That, that 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 is just abysmal, abysmal. And you do get well. I got, before I ask a serious question, I do have here. A skinny cappuccino and some <laughs> politicians have gone on a bit oh oh you're trying to win over the north a frothy you coffee a frothy coffee remember that oh and yeah. uh, what's he called frothy coffee oh my god it's all ridiculous we we've got a we've got a, a twitter page that's it, promoting right? local business actually and a lot of those businesses are artisan coffee shops so we actually do have those even in places like hartlepool you know like it's just it's just horrible to watch that. And that is the other thing that, you know, I didn't say this when we were talking about the strategic proposition to the left, which is that like, look, look how we feel as northerners, uh, left uh, socialist northerners to have been reduced to sort of racist bigots. We built a movement to push against that because as I, as I sometimes say, you know, I don't want a political party appealing to the people who bullied me at school. So I'm just not like, I'm not having like a sort of like dog whistling, homophobic, like xenophobic, like playing to the worst elements of us and saying that that's authentic Northern culture when actually we have a huge tradition on the left in the North, you know, like talk about, you know, Jarrow March, Miner's Strike, all these different like left traditions. You know, one of the found, one of the people who inspired the French Revolution was from Newcastle. Like there's all these histories that aren't even talked about. And um, I'd like to talk about those rather than, um, you know, pies, bigots, rain, that the stuff. Pies. I yeah. never liked mushy peas growing up, I have to say. And that <laughs> did set me apart from a lot of people I grew up with. In terms of, the, so the Scottish National Party, back in 2010, in that general election, they had six MPs and Labour yeah. had 41 MPs. Yeah. Labour obviously was hegemonic in Scotland for a long time, though people do forget, actually, there was... The Conservatives ran as the Unionists uh, for a long time. And in 1955, a majority of Scots voted for the Conservative sister party when most of England voted for the Labour Party, or more sorry, more people voted for the Labour Party in 1955 in England than in, than in Scotland. Um, but nonetheless, there's obviously, you know, the Cl the Red Clyde. Yeah, there's a strong history, of course. Yeah. And in, nine, in 2015, Labour went from 41 seats to one. <laughs> and the SNP went from six seats to 56. Fantastic is that the model? Is yeah. that the model? Yes, that's the model. Yes, that's the model. How are you going to do this? What's the strategy? How are you going to emulate a, a, what the SNP have just absolutely wiped out the Labour yeah. Party almost as a political force north? Of Wonderful. North. Fantastic. How are you going to do that? Uh, we're going to achieve it first from Hartlepool by winning Hartlepool which will be our base. But Hartlepool is a left behind town. Imagine what will happen if Hartlepool votes for the Northern Independence Party. All eyes will turn on Hartlepool. It will be no longer left behind. And I want to point out, they're not just voting for us, they're voting for Thelma Walker, who is a fantastic MP, who will be a brilliant representative to the people of Hartlepool, who's done amazing work on education. She is a social, she is a democratic socialist. I'm sick of people calling us like Corbynites or whatever. Like, of course we have people who supported Jeremy Corbyn within NIP but we also we also today before I came on Owen I wanted to talk to our members and see what sort of backgrounds they have I actually just spoke to someone who voted for the Tories in the last election and who's joined NIP so there's another way we're going to do it is that is that we're going to talk about those issues that appeal to people and bring them on board with a democratic socialist agenda by appealing to the things that matter in their everyday lives which is infrastructure we've got a talk we've got Tory membership now we got people who used to vote Tory because they're pissed off that the referendum wasn't respected. Sorry, I'm allowed to swear on this. Sorry. It's yeah, a, I mean, we'll probably it. <laughs> <laughs> so they got people who are annoyed, annoyed about the referendum. And then they also are upset about regional underdevelopment. And and then we move them into the party. And then, you know, we we're able to take that and, and, and shape that politics, because I believe that politics is also about shaping views, not just following them. Um, and that's fantastic. So there's one way we're going to win. We have cross-party appeal. 
The other way we're going to win is that, like, we have the most amazing talented activists. Like, that capacity that was built up in 2016, uh, sorry, in 2017, 2019, hasn't gone away. And it had nowhere to go. And it's now come to us. And I'm very happy about that. I welcome that in. I welcome those activists into the party. They're building amazing graphic design. They're doing our social media strategy. Like, it's amazing. And we have solidarity from a lot of left-wing organizations coming in and helping us as well. So there's another way we'll win. And then also, I mean, I can't reveal this now, but we are going to have some def defections coming up, not at an MP level, but uh, a lot of local local councillors. What we have is two branches of defections. We have still standing councillors and we have uh, people who had no platform to stand on because of the direction of the Labour Party had registered as independents and we will now be endorsing them um, as our candidates. So we do we are going to have elected representatives um, very shortly. So we'll from our councillors, we will then build towards MPs and I'll be standing, hopefully, if the members will select me in Sedgefield in 2023. Tony Blair's constituency. Like I said, I'm a specialist in the Middle East, so I would like to stand in the seat of a man most associated with destroying the region I studied. Um, so we will. that's how we're going to win, is we're going to... Activism, talented people, we've got community organising starting, we have a core relationship with Westminster, we've got capacity building, and we also have cross-party appeal. So we'll before win. I ask, before I ask you about Hartlepool... Yeah. I mean, some of what you said there, I suppose... So take the Scottish National Party. The point of an independence movement, by definition, is independence. It's to secure that. That becomes the end. That's the, that's yeah. the end. And what that will mean is, if you look at the Scottish National Party, they've evolved and adapted. So it used to be the case, not least when Alex Salmon was leader, before the financial crash, they would talk about Scotland becoming a Celtic tiger, emulating yeah. Ireland. Uh, yeah. principally by slashing corporation tax in order mm -hmm. to attract big businesses and to undercut what remains, of course, of the UK. Yeah. Um, now, after the financial crash, that they they then shifted tax. They went <laughs> over to the kind of no Nordic model. I yeah. mean, for a while, you know, people know the S&P was sometimes called the Tartan Tories. Yeah. Story. I believe that was also a Labour sort of uh, smear against some elements of the SNP to try and discredit them. But yeah, go ahead. Well, partly as well, it's because it, I think it partly goes back to 1979, the no confidence vote in the Labour government that paved the way for Thatcherism and how the SNP voted. Yeah, you're right. There's all sorts of complications. But nonetheless, isn't the danger that if with any independence movie that you're now, you're calling yourself proud democratic socialists, but because your aim is independence and you're saying you're attracting people who vote Tory and so on mm -hmm. that it ends up being a party which isn't above all else necessarily committed to social justice it may well do that in order to appeal to certain constituencies but it will be a cross-class coalition it will it, it will yeah. it will appeal to businesses as well as workers where i would say they have you know, capital and labor are locked in a struggle against each other because they have clashing interests mm -hmm. and that you'll end up being a party which, you know, independence is is all and the other issues become downgraded and you just adapt according to what the political conditions dictate. Yeah, well, to that, I would say, first of all, I'm a Democrat, so I don't particularly I'm not particularly bothered if other political parties emerge that advocate for independence from but from a different policy agenda. I can't do anything to stop that other than offer a more convincing platform as to why they should stick with NIP. So th that's just not our concern. If that happens, that's going to happen. That's what it means to live in a functioning democracy. That's also, by the way, why we are standing in Hartlepool is that Hartlepool deserves a left wing option, not a one party state. Um, and yeah, I mean, we have all those tensions um, emerging and developing within the party, but the way we've tried to head it off is that unlike Labour, we're not a broad church. I mean, Labour isn't a broad church now, let's be honest, but we are constitutionally, the foundational documents of our party is democratic socialism. If you are not an advocate of democratic socialism, I would suggest you either found your own party or look to a different party because that is what we are. And the reason is not ideological purity, it's that when you examine what is left of the North-South divide, what that actually means, the only solution is policies that we would be would be classified as democratic socialism. So heavy levels of state investment, etc. You know, there's a there's that bar chart that goes around quite a lot. 
which um, which is from 2011, but it shows you know that the, that London got two thousand something pounds per capita investment in public transport, and the North East got a fiver per person. Right, the way you address that is through democratic socialism. So I would say that even if you had people who are kind of more on the right economically, they would look at that sort of infrastructural problem and kind of agree that if you want to have good investment, even from their logic, would think you actually need to invest in transport and connectivity between cities. It's kind of obscene that in Newcastle, I want, I, a friend of mine was giving a paper at Liverpool, I wanted to go, but it, it was gonna be more expensive and longer for me to go to Liverpool than London. You know, with HS2, the midpoint for transport in the UK is going to be just outside of London. So I would say that if you like some of the things that we're concerned about that would require sort of democratic socialist levels of state intervention, someone on the right might even agree. And you know what my evidence also for that is, is that's kind of what the levelling up agenda is supposed to be playing with. Obviously, it's not and it's not real, but even the Tories kind of realise that there's something wrong with the infrastructure in the north. So, you know, like, I'm not bothered if there are right wing parties that take on northern independence, you know, like, I can't stop that. We live in a democracy. Um, we'll put forward a convincing agenda as to why it should be us. And then is it realistic? Look at the vo look at the voting, like, you know, the red wall, the notion of the red wall is Tory propaganda, because even in 2019, the vast majority of Northerners voted for that manifesto for 20, for, for, for Labour Party policies, which at that point we can say were left wing. 2017, vote share increased. So I actually don't think there's any serious risk that the North will vote for a right wing party. I think it's overplayed. And I think the reason why people were voting for right wing parties is because the kind of issues we talk about were never at the front of the agenda. And now they are. And so I, I think we'd actually see a collapse in that right wing vote. Harley Paul, now yeah. this is the big first, this is the biggie for the Northern Independence Party. Yeah. We've got a by election coming up next month. I suppose. How well do you think you're going to? Well, I know how we'll, we'll talk about that actually. How, what's the, what do you have any data basically? Is there any kind of inkling you can give us about how well you think you're currently doing in Harleyball? And I suppose without appointing myself your strategist, isn't it better to manage expectations a bit better? Because there's a lot of kind of cocky chat about Harleyball. Wouldn't it be better to go, well, look, we're a very new party. We've only just been founded. Who not, you know, we're going to do our very best, but we're up against these very established parties. They've got all the resources. So, you know, and we've What only... do you know about Hartlepool? Hartlepool, that's the exact sort of argument that doesn't work somewhere like Hartlepool. Hartlepool absolutely loves to give the establishment a good kicking. So but then being established part. But that's my well. I mean, they appointed, they voted for Peter Mandelson repeatedly. But I mean, that's that's true. That's true. But what I was wondering is, is what if I, I don't want to just all over your parade, but if the Northern Independence Party, for example, lost its deposit in Harleyball, given the the way you've spoken, big up the possibility, won't people then go? Well, it was just a Twitter bubble. This was meaningless. It doesn't actually have any roots on the ground i'm so very proud that we're a twitter bubble actually i think i I'm, I'm proud that we've done that and that's why we have all of these activists involved that are building the party i'm proud that we dominate social media and if you don't dominate, dominate so social media. yeah uh, like if you don't dominate social media you should see our facebook now we've got we've got all the we've got ex labor campaigns people now working on our facebook and we're going to start dominating that sphere as well so i'm sorry like dominating twitter is a great thing that's why i'm on here that. that's why i'm on here talking to you owen so like first of all i'm happy no, about that no you're and, right I, yeah your, your social media game is chef's kiss yeah. it is <laughs> something to behold and the labor party digital department could learn quite a lot and i bet they yeah. want considerably more than i'm sure your volunteers are but what oh, I mean, no, our volunteers get nothing. Yeah, we well, have that's what I mean. for that. Yeah. And no. they're getting shed loads of Labour members' money, often to do yeah. the most embarrassingly awful yeah. digital campaigning. Not, uh, I should talk about that's the Labour Party uh, yeah. within the, the party staff. Yeah. But in terms of what, how well do you think you're going to do in Harley Paul? And what, what is your narrative going to be? You yeah, know, you think like, are you gonna not lose your deposit? For example, what's your what's your evidence and and, yeah. and where are you? If it doesn't go well in Hartlepool, what's your strategy gonna be? Well, it's not about you know we weren't planning for Hartlepool. There was suddenly yeah. a by election, so we seized upon it and we seized upon it. Why? Because it gives us a huge platform, right? That's why we jumped upon it. But now, if you think about it, in Hartlepool, there's so many parties running. Four parties look like they could split the vote. A four-way split. 
actually like a four way split means that there's a potential where we could win if we if we have a heavy four way split in the void. The other issues that we have is like um, you know if you consider if you consider the voter demographic, you know, if you're if you're between 18 to 30 in Hartlepool, who are you going to vote for? Like, they're going to vote for us, right? Like, when I grew up in Durham under New Labour, I admittedly voted for the Liberal Democrats because there was nowhere else for my vote to go as a sort of progressive left wing type person. So now, I mean, I, I believe the Liberal Democrats are standing. Who knows? But basically, we're gonna we're gonna pick up that eighteen to thirty vote, and we're having a lot of productive meetings with sort of like local organisations who work around the older vote. And there's an assumption as well that we're not going to pick up older voters. Like that's not true either. There's a sort of kind of like oh, we the way we appeal to these over over 65s is by being bigoted. No, it's not. It's not. It's you appeal by talking about like local issues. Like people over 65 don't want to see their towns, uh, their, their high streets left to rot and all of their kids and grandkids move away. They also care about the things that we care about. And we actually have quite a lot of older members now. So, I mean, yeah, of course, there's a possibility we don't win, um, but it's about building the party and the ones I care about really winning is the getting those local election victories because that's how we build for the future and there are more by-elections probably going to come up and by then we'll have more of a machine right now we need to build the machine our membership numbers are through the roof every new member is more money more money means more ability to win and that's where we are we only have members money we only have members and donations and that's all we've got and, and we'll look at what we've achieved running on basically nothing we pay for a slack a slack headquarters for the party volunteers and we pay for google suite or something that's about it no adverts nothing and we're already controlling the narrative or trying to also i think we have to be clear speaking frankly and honestly victory under the first past the post system is not about winning seats it's about shaping an agenda we support changing the electoral system but if that doesn't happen, we will stand in marginal seats to force our agenda to, to, to make the North become a serious policy point. And that's, you know, another part of what victory looks like for us, because it's not actually about winning seats. It's a, it, it, I, mean, I, I think we'll win. I want us to win. I, have, I feel confident about it. Um, you know, like our Hartlepool team are all hearing good things from everyone they talk to. Labour is panicking, throwing people behind uh, uh, phone banking now, who I'm assuming are assuming are paid people now, because I don't know where all the volunteers are. So, you know, there's a panic. They know that we're going to hit that 18 to 30 vote, that we're going to start getting some of those older voters. I don't know, there's a chance. But even if it doesn't happen, we're shaping the agenda, and that's what victory looks like. The greatest political victory, great in the, in the sort of neutral sense, um, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years in this country is UKIP. We're not in the EU and they basically didn't win any seats except for by-elections or after, um, after defections. But they basically won no political power, yet they've shaped this country. So that's what victory looks like for us, shaping the country, either through seats or not, although we'll win in Hartlepool. Just quickly, why has Labour declined for so long in the North and... Why are Labour panicking, do you think so? Are they panicking really, or are they just... It did, but it didn't mindful? decline in 2017. It didn't decline in 2017. The vote share um, started were, decreasing. Well, but, but, okay, so it depends what we mean by decline. You're right. That's not... A, 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 the, the, the Labour share of the vote went up. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But there is a caveat. There was mm -hmm. a swing against Labour in lots mm -hmm. of seats in mm -hmm. that the Labour share of the vote went up in many constituencies, but the Tory vote also went up. And therefore, in lots of seats, there was a swing to, to Labour across the country, but in lots of the North, there was a swing away from Labour. So swing yeah. and share are different things. That's yeah. what I meant. But, but in that... any case, there was a long-standing problem. What happened yeah. in 2019 didn't come out of nowhere, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So yeah. what... What? Uh, tell me about that. Well, okay, so... I... Oh, sorry, st do it again. Sorry, go yeah. for it. Go for it. So what's what's interesting about that is um, I talk I, I've talked to like Alex Niven about this and and other people is that like you know you have to take into consideration um, uh, the the effect of property ownership you know Margaret Thatcher's great non reformist reform is generating all of these property owners so people in the north become invested in their value of their houses which might you know underlie some of that swing to the Tories and 
what do you do about that fact? Well, one of the things you can do is you promise infrastructural renewal because people, although under lockdown, this is less the case, but people generally don't never leave their houses. They go out into the street and they see potholes. They go and wait for a bus and it takes an hour to come. They hear about their kids' classrooms being, uh, being overcrowded. They pay too much for non-integrated public transport. So if you stand on that agenda, the sort of the, the, the real genuine levelling up, a proper, a proper, serious, considered, informed, joined up platform, you can win back those voters because otherwise they will, that, that, that's where that Tory votes come from. So that's why it's really key to win that, like um, win those older voters as well, because like, like we've said, you know, those, these towns, these towns in the north have been depopulated of their young people. But those young people in urban centres care about rent, etc. Right. But the people in towns don't care that much about rent because they're, they own their homes. So that's one of the reasons for the decline. And that's why we place the north south divide at the very front of all of our policy proposals is because we think that's what will that's what people actually care about. That's why we're doing well. Ultimately, it's not just about the memes and shit posting and whatever. It's also about the fact that our agenda is simple and clear. To fix the North-South divide, we need North-South separation. We need independence, political power. Otherwise, we're going to have the same thing we've had for hundreds of years, which is just fob offs. A bit more money here and there. Nothing joined up, nothing substantial, because the country is designed as a pyramid scheme. Everything goes to London because it's already in London. So obviously FDI, obviously investment goes to the place where it already exists. And only with a government with power in people's actual communities, power in, in the north would be able to reverse that. We think, at least. So finally, what, in terms of the new, I mean, you've said there'll be a referendum, I was going to say, on, on the monarchy. So I was going to say a new northern republic, but we, we don't know. That would be up to the people yeah. of the north to decide and unfortunately republican sentiment has gone up arguably but we're still those of us who are republicans are still in a minority wherever uh, we live in the country yeah but in terms of um where would so to just set out the borders of the new north that's what i'm interested yeah. in what's the capital going to be and what would be the kind of the, what for you with the northern independence party sweep the new elections of of the new north You've released this manifesto, but what would be the priorities of the new North, the new Northumbrian, whatever it's called? Uh, so, t yeah, just tell me the contours. I'm really interested in, in the contours because, I, I, I mean, I, I, Stoke is not going to make it. Let's just be really honest about this. And I will die in a ditch over this. Stoke is in the Midlands. It's important we say this sort of stuff because... I love the Midlands, but they're not worming their way into the north. And some do try. And get, some people in the south think anyone with a regional accent is northern. And yeah. Stoke on Trent is a, a huge amount of respect for Stoke on Trent, and I always love visiting. It's the Midlands, so I just want to make that absolutely clear. But that aside, what are the borders of the north? Um, where, where's its capital going to be? What's its constitution going to look like? And what are its founding policies going to be? There we go. Create the okay. country. No. All right. The borders, the border proposal is Cheshire, all of Yorkshire, northeast, northwest. So that's that, that yeah. that's what we consider the core north. That is the Below point. that, we have a, a, a strip of bordering territories where there is a sense of being in the north, but people would argue otherwise. Our policy is that... Like where? Of, where the uh, border like is. Nottinghamshire, for instance. You know, like Nottinghamshire these, is not the north. But it's we would give... We, we would give we would give those um, constituencies uh, the choice to have localized referendums to seed into Northumbria. Well, uh, we have get a war on your hands because I'm going to fight that. Yeah, when I people see the map, people, when people see the map, they wonder whether or not we mean a demilitarized zone. <laughs> and I always say, judging by the establishment's overreaction this week, it could well turn out to be a demilitarized zone. But what we actually mean is like they have the choice to join or not. We're going to have the Yorkshire border force, you know, bu building dry stored wall. <laughs> but no, like that's the, the those are. You know, Especially people... if they're sheep warriors from Nottinghamshire. Yeah. To... <laughs> like my friend's mum texted uh, text him saying, am I in the north or not? Will you ask Philip, please? <laughs> so that's the... That's the, that, that's oh, the you're the northern border. gatekeeper. <laughs> well, people always say, you know, like you don't even know what the north is. Another way to look at it is actually we put out these maps of where our members are and you can see that there's just a massive clustering of where the north actually is and you can actually see the north-south divide in terms of our members' distribution. So our members know where the north is. 
Um, and then, uh, yeah, the borders that we would maintain are uh, the Scottish borders. So, curiously, uh, Berwick upon Tweed uh, actually only has one member I can see. So maybe the Scots might have a claim to that if we don't get more members. But that would be the northern borders. Um, we are potentially considering standing in Barking just because of the Whippet logo. <laughs> but otherwise... <laughs> I Sorry, I'm, I'm, I sh I'm shifting covered. into the Twitter feed now rather than a serious I mean, political I interview. Southern, uh, I saw, was it Kensington and Chelsea? I don't know if that's yeah. real. Kensington we do have Chelsea. a lot of support uh, abroad now, which is really good for us. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that would be the borders. Foundational policies, um, we're talking about things like high-speed Northumbria. So we want to link up um, uh, with high-speed trains from Liverpool to Newcastle going through all the major, th major cities with feeding trains going into that line. We have a lot it's of a like, nightmare. People don't realise this a lot of the yeah, time in the south. Yeah. Transport, get you look on the map and you think, oh, yeah. these places are not far away. And then and then you look up yeah. and it takes like three hours to get there yeah. by train with oh, five yeah, look spots. At Look at Hartlepool. Hartlepool has a bus going to Durham and it takes several hours because there's no, not even a high-speed bus to link yeah. these. And they're right next to each other. It's just yeah. bonkers. And, yeah. and and you saw this because you were going to come up to Durham and you saw the same problem. You wanted to go from the west to the east coast. It's impossible. So how could you have a, a, a sort of balanced economy when we can't go east to west? We can only go north to south. Um, so, yeah, reversing that policy number one. Uh, policy number two, green industrial rebirth. We don't call it a revolution because we had a revolution. We call it a green industrial rebirth. So we're going to like look at, you know, decarbonizing the entirety of the northern economy, working a lot with our friends in the SNP uh, about how we would go about doing that in a sort of co a, a cooperative way, because that's a big policy agenda for the progressive elements of the SNP as well. I had a conversation where a guy was like, oh, you've got lots of trees. We don't have that many trees, but we've got sand. We could probably work out some sort of deal. Um, and what were your other questions? I've forgotten. <laughs> um, the, so we've done the borders. Okay, that's yeah. fine. We've done, I mean, the constitutional setup. I mean, oh, constitutional setup. That's ongoing, that question. Um, I'm an advocate for a federalist approach. Some people are really interested in um, sort of citizen assemblies being a foundational part of the constitution, especially when we have important and difficult issues. So, you know, getting a a randomly selected group of Northumbrians together to uh, battle out what is the best way forward and then bringing that to the, our legislative body. Capital cities, that's a good question as well. Well, that's a really important development question because what we don't want to do is put Manchester. it in Manchester. We don't want to put it in Manchester. Manchester. No, because what is the point of, of just replicating the London model but with Manchester? There's no point. You know, personally, I think Stop Liverpool... Hall. No, we're going to have multiple capitals. Liverpool, capital of culture. Manchester, potentially legislative. Leeds, financial. Durham, I always say Durham is like the Tibet. Like Durham is the spiritual heart of Northumbria because it's like, you know, it's where that sort of religious aspect of the North exists. So that's where I'm from, is from Durham, you know. But we potentially maybe have the juridical capital in Durham. Um, so we'd be basically, yeah, looking at multiple capitals on the sort of South African model. The key thing about where you put the capital is that that really affects the place. So there's also people within NIP putting forward proposals that we put it in towns and not cities. So when you're building a new country, you could actually just totally look at where is the best place de developmentally to put this capital. Um, fundamentally, what we don't want to do is Manchester. I'm sorry, we're just not doing London, London in the north, right? There's no point to that. There's no point. It's... I've just realised the other thing is, what would the South be? Because you're gonna, the new country is going to call be called Northumbria. Yeah. What? I, oh, what? what England. What's the going to be called? It's called England. We're north of England. The South is called England. We're called Northumbria. I mean, if you want, I mean, there are like Wessex and uh, type movements starting to emerge. But you know, if we leave first, well, Cornwall we'll be, might be like, yeah. well, we're off. Oh, well, yeah, we'll hope we have a lot of support with the Cornish independence movement. You know, the Corn 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 has like very similar um, sort of relationship to Westminster that we do, you know, so we have total solidarity with them. But their movements tend to be a bit more sort of devolution, um, not full on independence. Uh, though there are radical Cornish separatists, but not that many. <laughs> very curious bunch. <laughs> they are an interesting. It's Merion. Yeah. Wait a minute, if I look it up, what are they called? Merion. Merion Can Canal. Oh, that's it. It, it has, go. yeah, it's, it's related to the Welsh language. Uh, the North well, is, yeah. is, is, is Hen Ogled as well. We have our own Welsh name. Interesting when you go to Cornwall, you'll, you'll often hear people talking about the English. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah. Um, 
I suppose, yeah, finally. I mean, what would you say isn't... Ugh, you might have in the North the issue of... Well, TTs, because I want to end on a less kind of... Not obscure issue, but it's quite specific. Yeah. You'll have people in the North who support independence. And you'll have people in the North who are disillusioned with the Labour Party's current abject failure to offer any inspiring alternative whatsoever to the Tories, yeah. but they won't support independence, some of them. So isn't yeah. that the problem, that you're kind of falling potentially between people who support independence but aren't that left-wing mm. and people who wouldn't support northern independence but just want a party that better articulates and represents their left-wing ideals in a way Labour's currently failing to do and finally yeah. finally when's your prediction when's northern independence going to happen <laughs> so within within iap we do have that separation actually a little bit we call them the hard nips and the soft nips <laughs> you know like the, the, i don't know if you could call it that or it's, sorry i'm switching into timeline stuff again but we we, we have people we have the kind of people who are like full-on independence now independence priority and we have the people who want to use the as a platform um to advance the north south divide as a question um basically what i find happens is that the people you're talking about who are angry with labor the abject failure but aren't ready for independence normally what happens is they first have a kind of instinctive rejection to the idea but then slowly they think about it and they think about hey what's wrong with self-determination what's wrong with having like northern a northern government why, why would this not work why don't we have this like it works in scotland if you look at various statistics in scotland you know especially like scottish nhs and things like that you know they do a lot better than our regions right and that, that's because they have political power so why is this that odd of a proposal and then slowly we call you know we do call it again sorry we call it being greg pilled like people slowly begin to think about it and then they like okay yeah, actually this does make sense and then they come on board you know like with Thelma you know like obviously she wasn't immediately a northern separatist but I start as more we talk about it more we go through it more we discuss the policies and why it's the solution more it kind of makes sense um as a as a way to act because everything else we've tried hasn't worked and the reason it won't work is because it's how the country's built it's built in this way to filter everything to London so the, it, it, as a strategic proposition and a realistic proposition, it, slowly people do actually come on board. And the prediction for when it will happen, you know, maybe let's see what happens in the next general election. Because by that time, we'll, like, we, I, we have gone from a WhatsApp group to a credible threat in five months. In one day, you know, we went from ha ha joke to Labour activating its attack them as attack, attack, attack mode, which was an incredibly stupid tactic because that drove our membership up to almost 1,500. I think we are there, we're beyond that now. Our membership figures are going up exponentially every day because people don't actually like it when you attack literally the underdog. You know, we've got a little dog on the logo. They like, they we're getting more and more members all the time. Like, what are they doing? It's a, it's a spent force. Labour Party is a spent force. And we only have to look at that racist leaflet today about about um, the traveller community. It's a spent force if you're a progressive in this country. It's time for a new left force. We've, and you know, I know, or you know the history of the Labour Party as well as anyone. The same cycle happens again and again and again. The left get in and then they do everything in their power to make sure it never happens again, at least for a very long time. It's time to abandon it. Let's try a, not just a different left party, but a different approach. Radical, regional separatism. You hit it here. The, that was violent. That was quite tiring. <laughs> that was a rousing, a rousing proclamation <laughs> of northern... I can imagine you doing that from a big balcony. Yeah. I don't know which city in the north. A big, rousing speech announcing yeah. that on this day, the... the Nation of Northumbria has been born, and then the crowds go, ah! Well, look, reborn, reborn, reborn. Sorry, Re <laughs> come on, everyone. Blimey. Well, look, from a plastic northerner to a more authentic northerner, uh, it's been, it's been a big honor to talk about. It's absolutely fascinating, and all just you know, forget everything aside. This, for me, I think is indicative of the fact that there will be growing disillusionment with a Labour Party 
which as things stand is woefully and clearly failing to offer a genuine alternative to the Tories. And I think rather than going like, (laughs) what the Labour Party should be doing is thinking, look, a lot of the votes we got in 2019 uh, obviously Labour suffered a terrible defeat, got to 32%, but they should not think that's as low as it can get. And actually, mm-hmm. in terms of percentage, they've got lower than that in 2010 and 2015, for that matter, though the distribution of seats was more advantageous to the Labour Party in those elections. But but they can't take... There was a report, the Labour Together report, which a range of Labour figures um, put together, and the one thing they said in that report was... Labour should not take for granted its existing voters because that's what previous Labour parties have done. And look what happened in Scotland. Look what happened in the Red Wall. And I do think parties like this, if anything, are a massive kick up the backside, whatever happens in Hartlepool, uh, for a Labour party which should not think to itself these younger, often, you know, voters who are determined to build a a more just society are just going to trump out and vote for us no matter what. So this, you are... Clearly a warning shot that should not be ignored. Philip, it's been a real honour, very eloquently put, mm-hmm. and you've got Thank a you. stronger northern accent than I do. <laughs> but mine, mine comes out when I'm drunk. Um, but cheers. And uh, and uh, if, you're, if you're watching, please like and subscribe on the podcast. Do give us five stars, and I will speak to you all soon. Please support this channel for independent thought, discussion, of the most important issues that we face.